Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining our webinar today on staff development. Uh, we are looking forward to a really engaging and exciting webinar. We're glad that you could be here. So just as a reminder, uh, this presentation was funded by CDFI funds, but the information and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the authors um, and do not exactly reflect the opinions of CDFI fund or any other person, entity, or organization. Um, all right, so today in this webinar, we're going to be talking about equipping staff with the tools to be successful, um, which involves more than just skills training. Um, in this webinar, we're hoping that you're going to learn how to develop a holistic human capital development strategy um, to build staff competency and support your native CDFI's strength and sustainability. So our presenters today are myself. My name is Megan Bellato. I'm an independent consultant. We also are joined by Jeff Tickle, General Manager at Cook Inlet Lending Center, and Sheila Herrera, who's the Executive Director at Tiva Lending. Uh, Jeff and Sheila, do you want to say hi real quick? Hi, good morning. Good morning. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, now we'd love to hear from you all. Um, so if you would go ahead and type your name, your title, and what Native CDFI you represent there in the chat box. We just want to say a quick hello to everybody who's taken the time to join us today. Let's see, everyone is typing away. Hello, Becky from First Nations Community Financial and Cindy from Citizen Potawatomi Community Development Corp. Hi, Cindy. Beatrice from Lakota Federal Credit Union. Hello, Beatrice. Fancy Sun from Seneca Nations. Oh, lots of folks. Good. Well, you can all read yourselves there in the chat box. Um, keep letting us know that you're here. And uh, just so uh, you all know, that chat box is really a place where we really want to hear from you Throughout this whole presentation, um, please feel free to type in any check, any questions or comments, um, chat amongst yourselves. Um, we really want this to be something engaging that you all can feel comfortable participating in. Excellent. All right. So speaking of, um, as you continue to type in your names and who you're here representing, wanted to go ahead and open this poll up uh, for you all. So. Um, let us know if you have, if your organization has developed a human capital strategy. Um, so go ahead and let us know if you have, if you haven't, if you're not sure, or if you're in the process of doing that right now. Give everybody just a few moments to vote in there. All right, so go ahead and take a look at that. So what we're looking at is it looks like the vast majority of you have not developed one. Um, some of you are not sure and some of you are in the process. So this is a great time for us to be doing this uh, webinar. So hopefully after this you all will be inspired and equipped and ready to uh, move forward with that. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about what human capital is. Um, human capital is the intangible value of the employees of an organization, including their knowledge, skills, culture, trust, and experience. Trust includes the trust employees have in the mission and the work and the structure of the organization. It also includes the customers, uh, the trust the customers in the community have in the employees of the organization and the trust the organization has in the people that it employs. So all of these qualities add intrinsic value to the staff of a company, meaning that the employees who work there are worth more than just the positions that they fill. So uh, the value to companies of organizations, companies and organizations benefit from investing in their staff. Building and supporting staff in a variety of ways results in greater skilled employees and improves retention. Less turnover saves organizations and companies time and money that they might otherwise spend on recruitment and training. Equipping staff also results in greater productivity and efficiency and ultimately creates opportunities for organizational growth and sustainability. So also, on the flip side, employees benefit from an employer that invests in their skills, knowledge, and career growth. 
Potential employees are always attracted to a job that provides them with the opportunity to build skill sets and build their career. They see training and development as a benefit rather than a requirement of their jobs. Um, they show increased confidence in their work and are equipped to seek solutions that benefit the organization. And ultimately, employees who feel that they are valuable and important to their employer are more likely to buy into the mission and support the work of the organization. So before we move forward, any questions or thoughts about any of that? Sheila or Jeff, do you have anything to add? No, I don't. Okay. No worries. Megan, I, oh. I just, uh, Megan, I, I just like to add, um, you know, when we talk about the value to employees and, and uh, training and development, uh, having, trying to have a team that, uh, that has a, a sort of culture knowledge and institutional knowledge has been key for us here at Cook and the Lending Center. Uh, we have one employee who's been here the longest, and when other people join our team, she sort of leads the way as far as being an ambassador, um, sort of being able to communicate that that historical institutional knowledge of, of our organization. And, and uh, I think that... Uh, that helps when people join for them to buy in, to see someone who's who has that tenure. Uh, so yeah. I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up. Having that, um, that person that can sort of share their experiences and sort of, again, share that historical and cultural knowledge, I think is really great for buy-in and loyalty. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about staff training. Staff training refers to the teaching of specific knowledge or job-related skills. Question for you all participants, um, go ahead and type in the box, what are the areas of training your staff need the most? We know we've heard from a lot of you um, that you want to train your staff on um, potentially mortgage lending or, or mortgage underwriting or um, filing and organizational skills. Um, so I know a lot of you have been thinking deeply about this. So um, go ahead and share some of the training areas that you feel like your staff uh, would benefit from receiving. We've got some responses coming in. Just waiting to see what they look like. Loan management, contracts and accounting, mortgage underwriting, data collection and communication. We hear about data collection a lot. Team building, communication, Microsoft Office skills, financial coaching, NMLS certification, mortgage underwriting, yep. Mortgage, um, mortgage underwriting is something we often hear a lot. Strong portfolio management, yep. Underwriting and marketing. Marketing is a big one. A lot of folks um, have talked to us about this. Financial organization, confidential information not being shared over the phone, that's important. Nonprofit administrative assistance, yeah, absolutely. A lot of really good ones in here. So feel free to go ahead and keep typing those. We're going to move on. Thank you for sharing. Being able to tell the story of the native CDFI, I love that. That's a big one. Um, customer service, also a big one. All right, so there's a lot to choose from here. There's a lot of options. So when considering how to prioritize your training needs for your staff, there are a couple ways that you can begin to do that research. Um, first, it's a good idea to try to identify the skill sets or core competencies that are needed for each staff role. And a quick way to do this may be to review the job descriptions for each role, even if some people may be wearing multiple hats or probably are wearing multiple hats. This is going to help you to identify needs and opportunities for your staff. Um, another good thing to do is to look at the benchmark goals or future growth strategies for your organization and consider what trainings might help with that. So perhaps you'd like to create a more aggressive capitalization plan, but your staff might need more training and grant writing, or your CDFI plans to expand into mortgage lending, which is what we're hearing a lot of, um, in the next two years, but currently has no expertise with that. So that's another good way of thinking about it. Another, another thing to consider and probably the best way to identify what training needs would be useful for your staff is to just ask them. 
Um, informal conversations, a staff meeting, or an employee survey are all really excellent ways to gather information about what sorts of trainings or workshops your staff will actually help them to do their jobs better. So here are some strategies for identifying the right training. Once you've identified your training needs and priorities, there's so many resources out there, and it can be very challenging to figure out how to narrow down what the right training to to, to employ for your staff. Investing in training is really important, but it's also costly financially and in time and resources, and you'll want to think about all of this when choosing what training to offer. So first and probably most obvious, you're going to want to identify a training that meets your budget, but it's also important to consider the cost of employees engaging in a training and not actually being at work, or the cost of organizational physical resources like a conference room or a computer that may be usually used for something else. So another thing to think about is accessibility. Um, are you looking for an in-person training or something that can be done remotely? Would it be appropriate to find a group training or something self-paced that an employee can complete on their own? You're also going to want to consider the timing of the training, both from an organizational perspective. Um, no one wants to have a stat, all the staff be out of the training right before a major grant deadline or from the perspective of your staff. So like night and weekend trainings may be challenging for staff um, due to families or personal commitments. Um, so additionally, what are the resource requirements and does it make sense for your organization? So would a remote web-based training be the right fit for you all um, or an in-person or driving three hours to an in-person training? So that's really accessibility is something really helpful to think about. And then while it may also seem obvious, you should also consider the value of the training in relation to your training priorities and needs that we just discussed. There could be trainings that are important because they meet immediate needs, but some, again, may be helpful in the long term as your CDFI grows and expands. And then finally, try to review any trainings to make sure they're in line with your staff culture and the mission of your work. Is the training culturally appropriate for your staff and the customers that you serve? But also think about whether it aligns with your business practices, your policies and procedures, and so forth. It may be tempting to identify the cheapest training option or the most convenient, particularly when you've identified a lot of pressing knowledge uh, or skill gaps uh, in your staff. But taking some of these into consideration can really make sure that you're getting the most out of the investment of the training. I want to pause here. Jeff or Sheila, do you have other things to add? Hey, Megan, Hi. this is Hi. Jeff. And, and I just wanted to um, to mention, so when, it, when you, I see a lot of uh, – uh, comments around mortgage, you know, lending, mortgage policies, and uh, and it just makes me think about um, what Cook Inlet um, experienced a couple of years ago as far as um, having our first exam by the state of Alaska around mortgage lending, and and it relates to that value and, and relating to the identified needs, and we we found out very quickly um, that our training for our staff um, needed to. Um, be wrapped around mortgage compliance and mortgage policy. Um, and we were able to use uh, a resource um, called Ellie May that uh, fit our budget, um, it fit our need as far as the, um, the training requirements that, uh, that we needed to have around mortgage lending, specifically around uh, Bank Secrecy Act, anti-money laundering, um, red flags, et cetera, et cetera. There's, I, don't, I won't get into the weeds, but, but that resource of Ellie Mae um, allowed us to uh, draft policy, allowed us to a resource to do continuing education each year for that training. Um, we're, we're doing it right now, uh, September and October, our quote unquote compliance month, where we finish all of our, or we complete all of our annual training. But I just wanted to mention that as a resource, because I see a lot of, um, comments around mortgage lending here. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you, Jeff. Sheila? There's also some other related neighborhood works course that you can, um, that involves, you know, like um, your underwriting, I, I was looking at, there's some intermediate underwriting for mortgage lenders, small business, uh, time management, human resources. There's financial analysis and business planning, and those are all um, related courses. They're all pretty much any, you can look under neighborhood works under, if, on the underwriting part, LE220. Those are intermediate underwriting for mortgage lenders. And there's also a great class that I took 
um, for the compliance section. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out. NeighborWorks is a really great resource for a lot of training. So that's excellent. Thank you, Sheila. If anyone's not familiar with NeighborWorks, um, definitely go onto their website and check them out. They've got a ton and ton of really good resources, and they're generally fairly affordable and accessible. Um, right. There's also some other webinar trainings that you can um, that's available, like developing trust and respect, respect in the workplace. 10 Keys to Effective Performance Reviews, how, you know, how to handle the emotionally charged situations in the workplace, supervise off-site employees, handling personality clashes in the workplace. There's also safety, you know, we've been with a lot of those active gun shooters, that you can um, have webinars on that and train your staff. That's great, that's an excellent resource. Thank you for sharing. All right, participants, what other questions do you have about identifying training opportunities? We just heard about a couple really great resources and talked about some of the priorities, but do you have any other questions about um, specific job trainings for your employees? Got a few folks typing in some questions here. And again, feel free to go ahead and continue to um, share questions or comments or thoughts throughout the presentation. Um, these cues are just to give you a specific place, but you can you can type at any time. Yeah, I agree. Diana Pickernell said um, that some hands-on is very important. I think that's that's really true. And I assume by that you mean kind of engaging in-person trainings and that involves lots of staff at all levels, not just um, sending, you know, a, a junior staff person off to receive a training. Uh, Sheila or Jennifer, anybody else have recommended trainings for staff types, loan officer, finance marketing, and certifications? And then Sharon James had a good question for the group. Um, how have others addressed closing the office when all of the staff needs to be trained? Personally, like when Miranda and myself and we have to leave our office, you know, you're just checking in. I mean, your emails, um, you could say maybe your, your cell phone, making yourself available still when you're out of the office, you know, always return your phone calls. Yeah, I think that's yeah, great. Echo. I think also. Go ahead. Sorry, Jeff. I was just gonna. I was just gonna echo that. Is is uh, if you know you're gonna be out ahead of time, maybe posting something ahead of time that you'll be mm -hmm. out um, is, is a good idea. We have uh, um, our partner, our parent company has a program called Career Ready, and um, and so they the, we we will ask one of the Career Ready, um, basically it's, kind of, it's almost like an intern. Uh, to come over and and simply um, be at our front front desk to help anyone and um, but I think just you know letting letting people know ahead of time communication email yeah 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 I think that's great I think that's this, these are really good points I was just going to echo exactly what you said Jeff is is making sure that you're letting all of your Customers and clients know well in advance when things are going to be closed. But um, we've had a couple other comments here about um, the importance of team building, and we're going to get into a little bit of that in staff development section. But I agree, is keeping your staff engaged and avoiding burnout is really important. So that's a, that's another good one. Um, and there's this great idea about splitting trainings in half. Half the staff goes to the first session, and the second session for the rest of the staff. I've done that um, when I've worked at organizations before. We've done that with uh, management training before, and that does seem to work out very well. Um, and then we have some specific questions in here um, from Natalie Charlie looking for uh, some resources and audit prep training, financial policies, separation of duties, and things like that. So if anyone has thoughts about that, um, go ahead and type them into the chat box. But thank you. These are really good comments and questions. All right. So now we're going to talk. Go ahead. Oh, on what Natalie was talking about on um, training on the audit training, I think just kind of you know getting a list of things items. What we do is we'll get a list of items from our auditor, 
and then we work real closely with our bookkeeper um, and just, you know, kind of go over everything, make sure we have all our, our records, complete that list together my, with the bookkeeper and myself. Really helpful. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah, if anyone has any other ideas, please go ahead and type them on into the, the chat box there. Um, Moving forward, let's talk a little bit about staff development. Staff development is different than staff training. It refers to the activities or processes that support short and long-term knowledge, skills, and personal effectiveness. Um, so it is a little bit different. Um, it includes things like performance management procedures, organizational culture, career development. Um, so let's, let's kind of dig in here. And I think some of your comments around um, team building and staff engagement um, will be really relevant here. So the core function of developing staff is about creating a process by which an employee can be evaluated on their performance and receive feedback about the specific ways that they can improve or be successful in their role. Performance management can range from semi-formal to very structured, and it's going to be unique for each organization. Performance management is the way that employees and managers give and receive feedback about their performance, and they should always be documented. Um, individual development plans are documented plans a manager or supervisor creates with an employee to help them think about their individual goals. These canons should be related to their current job duties, but will ideally go beyond this because they're designed to really help an employee think about their career growth in the short and medium term. And then goal setting is a process of helping an employee think about their work um, in the short, medium, but also the long term. Short term goals can be as straightforward as implementing a standard filing system for processing intakes. But long-term goals can be as broad as building competency and financial management techniques. Let's take a little bit of a deeper look here. So here's a sample performance review. This is actually pulled from a previous performance review that um, I uh, had from an organization I worked at a while back. You're going to want to develop some sort of form or system that documents employees' reviews. So the ways in which you measure your employees' performance is up to you. But it's really important to be explicit <clears throat> excuse me, about how they're going to be evaluated so that everybody is on the same page and everybody knows what's coming. Um, make sure that the review connects directly with the expectations that you have for the position the person is in. And also definitely remember that a performance review is not a disciplinary tool. So any egregious actions that go beyond the scope of the work product should be handled and documented separately. Um, a review is really an opportunity to tell an employee how successful or not successful they've been at their jobs and provide concrete action steps for how they can improve or continue to thrive. Um, this can be a really complicated thing. Nobody likes, employee, nobody likes a performance review, um, but it's great to have uh, all of these different elements that I've highlighted here because it can really reduce some of that anxiety and stress. And again, thinking of an employee, a, a performance review is an opportunity to really talk about um, up like ways to improve or ways to keep doing a great job as opposed to thinking of, an, of a performance review as an opportunity to tell an employee what they're doing wrong. Um, so developing the system for regularly and identifying specific goals or tasks that employees expect to accomplish over a certain period of time is where you put those performance goals. Um, so you document these agreed upon expectations in advance, and that gives managers and supervisors a way of holding employees accountable to the work that they agreed to do. And it's also helpful for employees to know what's expected of them and how they will be evaluated. So typically, you'll want to do uh, performance goals first. Um, sorry, I didn't move that slide over. Um, Performance goals first with all of these, this method of setting agreed upon performance goals. Um, it's nice to have specific measurable outcomes and timelines um, and a time frame to clarify those expectations. And then making sure that the goals specifically relate to the work and the employee's job description. And then having this performance review, um, which directly relates back to those goals so that everybody kind of has an understanding of the, of the path of what's happening. And then, Finally, um, goal setting beyond specific job tasks helps an employee to grow their knowledge and skill sets beyond their specific job duties. So by supporting their talent growth over the long term, you're going to help them to become even better employees for your organization. So staff development might... Yeah, go ahead. 
this is Jeff. It's, uh, and I and I was just thinking about, um, you know, you talked about the timing of, of the goal setting and the performance evaluation. Our experience when I first started five years ago, um, it was our practice to do performance evaluations on a quarterly basis, so four times a year. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We we, we reevaluated that and and really kind of narrowed it down. We, we do our goal setting in January. We do our first performance evaluation in March, our second one in August, and the third one in December. So instead of doing it four times a year, we we um, we we decreased it to three times a year, which I think uh, it helped our team because we it, they just it seemed to get a little stale doing it so often the four times a year. Um, that said, you you obviously want to make sure that you're checking in with your staff, you know, I, on a daily basis, weekly basis. You, you check in with them, but um, you know, as far as the the performance evaluations, I, I feel like. Um, the three times a year was a good number for us anyway. You talked about goals and how they, you know, need to relate to the roles in the, in the organization. Right, we have different categories for our goal setting, um, one around mission, one around departmental goals, one around the employee's development. So, you know, that's when we, we talk about one-on-one -on -one about what training they, they feel they want to, uh, to go after, and then, and then around our corporate values. Um, also, each year, our CEO of the our parent company um, has an annual theme, and uh, and one of the goals um, can be wrapped around that. Um, this year, it was around team building. So, um, having goals with your with your individual staff member about potentially building a team for a certain uh, for a certain um, vision or direction was uh, something that's worked for us really well. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think that's a great point. A lot of the organizations I've worked for in the past have um, do have those kinds of categories, and some of the goals are the goals would need to be tied to specific, like organizational strategic goals um, that the board has decided on, and then again departmental goals, and everything kind of relates to each other. That can be a really helpful tool for your employees to kind of know why they're being held to certain standards or why they're being asked to do certain things if the connection is not completely obvious. Um, and so that can really can help to get that buy-in like for different activities, trainings, things that um, you're talking to your employee about and saying, I think this would be really helpful um, if you can then tie that to different departmental goals or organizational goals or mission even. Um, so making that connection very clear can be really, really helpful in a performance review process and for setting goals. And I agree with you also about the timing. Um, I think every organization needs to decide for themselves how frequently they do need to do performance reviews um, or goal setting with their uh, staff. And that's something that I think you can also talk to your staff about and ask them what they think makes sense for them as well. So how frequently do they want to be checked in on? And um, again, kind of making this performance review process and goal setting process kind of an iterative um, kind of joint process of how can you do your job better? What do you need? What tools do you need? If you haven't done well or if you're not meeting, what can we do to get you to a place where you are performing at a high level and you feel really comfortable at your job? And if that means you know, quarterly reviews and goal setting or annual reviews and goal setting, what does that look like? Um, and again, like just to highlight the importance of kind of putting that time frame on achieving different goals. So in the next six months, we might expect you to do X, Y, Z. Um, and then you have that um, marker to say, did, were, were you able to accomplish this? So putting that time frame can be really helpful um, for staff as they're trying to think about how to achieve different goals. Um, that was really great. Thank you for sharing. All right. So just another note here, staff development um, doesn't just relate to um, goals and performance reviews. It's also all these other things. So career path guidance um, can be applied in a variety of different ways. And that's really about identifying the broader ways that employees in general can build their competencies, competencies and careers through promotions, training, experiences. Um, so having some career paths within your organization kind of laid out in advance to show an employee how they can rise through the ranks can be really helpful for them to, to think about how they can grow within the organization. 
Um, external training is uh, refers to training opportunities outside of the company or organization that might provide value. So many of you mentioned sort of team building and things like that. Um, I once took a six-week storytelling class uh, workshop outside of my um, organization to support my ability to tell the story of the work that we did as a team um, for marketing and fundraising purposes. So it was completely kind of off the grid, totally different. It wasn't job specific, but it was something that really helped me to do that storytelling that, that somebody mentioned earlier. Um, so thinking, being creative about some of those external trainings is also a great opportunity. Um, so I would encourage you to, to think about those and also help encourage your staff to think about what are some of those sort of out of the box trainings that can be helpful. Mentorship and coaching refers to opportunities for advice, guidance, and training outside of the formal performance management process. So as Jeff said, you know, it's always important to kind of um, check in with your staff frequently, daily, weekly, um, have those kind of structured check-ins, but also um, thinking about other ways that you can kind of cultivate a, uh, an environment that includes that, um, supports mentorship and coaching. And so it's not strictly confined to the supervisor-employee relationship. Staff can find and provide mentorship and coaching and coaching across the team. And it can even happen with peers at the same professional level. So finding opportunities to really cultivate that mentorship and coaching can really help support folks as they're thinking about how to do their job, and it really supports team building as well. And then there's staff appreciation, which is just a great way of showing staff that they're valued members of the team. So anything from, you know, whatever your budget can afford, really, all staff luncheons, celebrations, activities outside of the office. Um, I've always enjoyed all staff volunteer days um, at the organizations I've worked with. Retreats are also a great um, kind of team building activity. Um, so just kind of thinking about ways that you can support your staff outside of um, just the formal review process. Um, Jeff or Sheila, did you have any other thoughts about other types of staff development? Um, I think just, you know, I really think the staff appreciation is important. I mean, like you said, retreats and going out, bringing banana splits in, going out to lunch with them, just kind of getting to, to know them uh, helps out a lot. Yeah, hey, Megan, it's um, when, it, when I look at the mentorship and coaching, it, uh, it makes me think about um, how our, we have a team of about eight staff. And so cross-training and wearing different hats is, um, is prevalent in, in, our, in our world here. And so as an example, when I had the opportunity to promote within, um, for example, having a, um, a loan officer who might be moving into um, a loan underwriter position, and when I replace that loan officer position, as that my um, current employee is transitioning into their new role, having them as an ambassador to the new employee and doing cross-training with the loan originating prior to them transitioning into their new role um, is, has, has worked well. Um, we actually have a program called the Ambassador Program where, um, you know, our staff um, takes it upon, it kind of, kind of empower, gets empowered when we have a new employee that starts to be able to, to show them around and, and, um, and just be there for questions, um, which helps free up, you know, my time a little bit, but also I think it helps develop the current um, person who's acting as the ambassador um, as far as them providing some support to, to a new team member, and it just sort of develops some, some chemistry immediately. And, and I think that's huge. Um, and then to to Sheila's point, the the staff appreciation that's a, that's a big one too. Is we have a program called uh, it's it's a recognition program where uh, managers and employees are allocated um, points each year, and they can give out those points to fellow employees, fellow managers um, for you know something that they felt um, was helpful to them or or helpful to the organization and to the mission, and and they can redeem those points for, um, you know, movie gift cards or um, what have you. But uh, just an idea. You know, that's actually a really cool idea. I love that. I think also including your staff in in taking your staff to maybe one of your board meetings, 
and recognize them in front of your board. Yeah. And, let, and that makes them feel like um, self-accomplished, let, you know, lets them know that, you know, somebody higher up is also recognizing them. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, I love that. And, and we're talking about a lot of, like, cross-training opportunities and cross-experiences. Um, and I think that that is just such a great way and um, to, to build, as Jeff was saying, staff competency at, at all levels, from the person who is kind of experiencing what another staff member is doing to that, pers that staff person um, kind of telling their coworker what they do on a daily basis. I worked at the food bank in Atlanta many, many years ago, and one of the uh, opportunities that they had, the program that they had, is that they – allowed any staff person once a quarter could step could go and shadow a different staff person's uh, role. And we, it's a pretty large food bank of about 200 employees, and I worked in the development on the development team. And so once a quarter, I could go out with the truck drivers who actually went around and picked up the food, or I worked with the uh, stockers in the warehouse who actually stocked and wrapped the food. And it was just a really great way of kind of seeing how all of us work together to uh, achieve our mission to uh, solving hunger in the Atlanta area. And it was just, it was not only interesting to get to talk to other coworkers that I wouldn't normally talk to, um, but it really made, helped me to feel like we were all part of a team together. Um, so I love that idea. And I also love the idea of bringing your board, your team members to board meetings. Um, I think that that's great on multiple levels. It, it builds your board's knowledge of your staff. Um, and it also helps your staff to feel sort of, as you said, Sheila, um, kind of acknowledged and valued, but also helps them to see kind of the larger part of the work that you're all doing together. So I think these are some really great, some really great suggestions and ideas. When you, um, when you have a, when you have a small staff, sometimes when you have a small staff and there's other meetings and, you know, the, the executive director, manager's like, i got to go to a meeting, I'm going to go do this. You know, sometimes you feel like you're, leaving the office a lot, yeah. and then you're leaving your staff there. And sometimes I think it's important to say, you know what, I'm going to close up the office. I want you to come to this meeting with me, especially if it's mm -hmm. going to involve something to do with a, a process that, I don't know, any type of process through, through your, your company, like through the going to, um, like in our case, we are a lot of, um, we, we do, we work with a, in a lot of meetings with FEMA, and we do, with, we work a lot with BIA. Um, we're involved in a lot of um, meetings here at Pueblo Visleta, and, and we'll just close out the office and say, come on, let's go, Miranda, you need to listen to this. Because sometimes I can bring back the information, but it's going to be, it's better for her. Also, everybody else gets to see that she's going out there and attending the meetings, and, you know, it, it's important. Yeah, I totally agree. I love that. I think that's really great. And I also love, I would also like to work for Natalie, Charlie, who, who takes their staff on an overnight trip and spend the evening and the day talking about anything other than work to de-stress and apparently get massages and go to the spa. That sounds pretty oh, great. <laughs> okay, Natalie. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a lot. I love it. Um, another, just another cheap idea before we move on um, that I've seen done at organizations I've worked for is kind of similar to the point system, um, but not involving actual points, but anonymous note dropping um, that just sort of into a box that that where someone can acknowledge um, the value that they see in a coworker, or another employee, um, in a totally anonymous way, and then those are read out loud at um, monthly staff meetings. Um, that can be a really great way for employees to just kind of share with each other and express appreciation for one another um, and for supervisors and all of that as well. So that's another great way to kind of build um, rapport and, um, you know, trust and appreciation. Um, yeah, the escape room. I've definitely had to do the escape room on many a staff retreat. Um, okay, let's move okay. forward. Go ahead. Another thing that I like to do is when you're doing it, working on your budget, do a surprise, you know, like a bonus, like for Christmas or some type of incentive. To say, here's, you know, it might not be a lot, but here's a couple hundred dollars, you know, just so, just for you, just because you're doing a great job. 
And we can all incorporate that into our budget. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody, <coughs> excuse me, everybody loves that. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea. So let's talk about developing a human capital strategy, um, putting this all together. So putting together a human capital strategy does involve kind of writing down all of your strategies for acquiring, managing, and retaining your staff. That includes the training elements and the development elements, but also all the policies and procedures that you use to guide um, your management strategy. So I have a poll for you all. Um, Please select all that apply. So um, we have a uh, standard process, um, onboarding process for new employees. We have an, a defined process for performance management. We have an employee handbook. We utilize individual, individual development plans with our staff. Or we currently do not utilize any of the above techniques for managing staff. So go ahead and let us know which of those things you all employ. Give it just another second. All right, excellent. So it looks like you, a lot of you do have a standard process for onboarding employees. Um, it looks about half of you have a defined process for performance management. Um, some folks, most folks have an employee handbook. Um, some people are, are using individual development plans, which is great. Um, and some people aren't actually using any of the above techniques, which is totally fine, depending on kind of where you are. Um, a lot of these might look really different. Excellent. Thank you for signing in there. All right. So when considering a human capital strategy, um, it might be helpful to think about the employee life cycle. So there are very likely very different strategies for interacting with staff uh, based on where they are in this wheel. And you'll want to think about what your organization's practices are for recruitment. What do you share with potential employees about the work environment, the benefits, and so forth? And then onboarding, what standard training have you identified that all new employees have to undergo, if at all, uh, or what standard training does a person in that specific job role need to have? Um, furthermore, there are other onboarding activities that might be useful for a new employee in learning about the organizational culture or business practices, and that can be just as straight, straightforward as reviewing an employee handbook. Um, through de the development and retention strategies are listed on this wheel separately, it might be helpful to think of them as one and the same. So what practices have you implemented to help an employee build their competency and confidence outside of their job tasks, everything that we were just talking about? And how are you helping them grow in their, grow in their role at your organization? This is where you might want to think about implementing some practices like individual development plans or more generally what your performance management processes are. It's always helpful to have some sort of standard review policy policy, even if it's not as formal as uh, an individual development plan, an IDP, or a performance review process, but it's helpful to have this so the staff can know how they're doing at their job and talk about strategies for growth and continued success. And then finally, what's your process for an employee exiting? Do you have an exit survey or a process for ensuring work responsibilities that that person holds are appropriately accounted for and redistributed. Um, all of these are important things to think about. So when you're thinking about your performance management strategies, as well as your policies and procedures for each of these stages, um, you'll want to kind of break it down. No matter how extensive or light touch your overall human capital strategy might be, it's important to have at least some standard policies and procedures for employee code of conduct, for hiring, or dismissal and exit. All right, so let's talk specifically about recruitment. When you're recruiting employees, you'll want to first spend some time thinking about the roles you need to fill and what those job responsibilities entail. It's helpful to create detailed job descriptions for every position. So you'll want to consider the qualities you're looking for an employee to determine a good fit. People do bring more to the table than their job-specific skill sets, and you'll want to find somebody who not only brings new and useful qualities to the table, like creativity or passion or integrity, but who also feels comfortable in their role and will want to remain an employee. So think about ways you can attract employees to your native to DFI. What about your mission or, or your work do you want to share um, as you're doing that recruitment? These are just some things to, to consider. So when thinking about planning for onboarding, 
um, this is pretty important. Um, when onboarding employees, you're going to want to take some time to help them to become familiar with the organization as a whole. And this may include a review of the employee handbook, as I said, or policies and procedures. Um, you're also going to want to make sure they're oriented appropriately to their specific work role. So it's a good idea to outline your expectations for work product and output, including helping the employee to become familiar with any technology or systems they'll be expected to use. And then finally, again, think about what trainings that employee should complete in order to be successful. Jeff or Sheila, any other thoughts about onboarding? Well, I think, you know, what I, what I do is when we're looking for somebody, we make sure, well, I've gone through like, the, like different interns different programs to Pebble this letter, but actually sitting down and going over their their duties and their responsibilities, uh, the description of their work, making sure that they understand everything that's expected of them. And then at that point, we'll have them initial it, have them look at the personnel policies, then that's going to help you to be able to monitor them to see how they're going to, how they're performing in their job. Yeah, I, I think that's great. I, I guess my Definitely. only comment is, is, um, is in the first couple of weeks, I think you just you just plan to spend a little bit more time with them um, to make sure that uh, you know they they're clear on what their what their goals, what their role is, what their goals are, um, the tools that they have, the tools that they might need that you don't know that they need. Um, and so just in those first couple of weeks, and, and then you, 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 could, you, you tend to get an idea after those first couple of weeks of, of uh, you know, how much time you, you might need to spend with them. So, uh, yeah. 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 If, if, they're, if, if one of their job performances is, you know, a big part of their job is maybe collections, and you kind of see that they're having a hard time with collections because they're having to collect from, from tribal members in, in the community or relatives or people, you know, people that they know, and if you see them struggling with that, um, talk to them about it and get them help. You know, hire a consultant to come in and work with them on the collections part. Work with them on going to court. Uh, but you know, that's just one of the examples. Or leadership skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, leadership skills are are always really important as well. Um, and I like this question that Sharon posed to the group, tips on busy schedules and making time for new staff orientation and training um, so you're not just kind of dropping them in and letting them sink or swim. I've definitely, I think we've all been in that position where we've uh, taken on a new role and then kind of been like, wow, I don't know what I'm doing and no one seems to have time to tell me about it. Um, and I think that that is a place, I'd love to hear any input that other folks have. I think trying to make time in the first couple of weeks or setting aside some time um, is probably the most helpful. But if you're in a particularly busy time or, or you're just swamped, um, I think having as much kind of planned out and written as possible um, can also be really helpful. What I had uh, one time when I started a new position is everybody on the team on my in my team, folks that were junior to me and folks that were senior to me and folks in my same level, in advance of me coming on board, um, created an an onboarding document um, that ended up being like three or four pages that from each person's perspective, things that they thought it would be important for me to know um, and things that they thought, um, you know, th ideas about the work that I would be doing, um, including some references of places that I could look. Um, and also, I think, uh, if you as a supervisor know that you're not going to have a ton of time when you have a new employee coming on, um, identifying other folks on the team that can jump in um, and be that person kind of like a uh, touchstone, um, you know, creating that mentorship or that buddy system so that, um, you know, even if that you don't have time to really spend time with that, that new staff person, making sure that they know that there are other places where they can get those resources can be really helpful. Um, yeah, and exactly, that, Jeff just uh, included that. Having someone on staff that may have time to mentor can be key. So those are some really great ideas. All right, let's talk a little bit about policies and procedures. Um, policies and procedures are the written guidelines that regulate how an organization operates, which provides legal protection and justification for decision-making processes. So that includes organizational governance, personnel processes, and financial management processes. 
So developing uh, policies and procedures, um, you're going to want to think about um, the operating practices of the organization and the legal justification behind them. So uh, a policies and procedures is also going to include all the specific forms and processes for operations, including performance review forms, purchase order agreement forms, and so forth. Um, when you begin to develop your policies and procedures, you may want to go ahead and involve your board or staff. Staff could have helpful input on what could be missing or needs to be clarified, and the board will want to review them for legal purposes. So again, like within that, um, that policies and procedures, thinking about all of your personnel policies, workplace expectations, everything from like dress code to the times that your offices are open. Um, a lot of folks now are putting time limits on when emails can be sent, no emails after 7 p.m. or things like that. Uh, disciplinary procedures will need to go in your policies and procedures. Um, exit and termination procedures and forms, so staff interview, exit interview or exit survey or what the process is for um, a, an employee exiting the organization. Compensation and benefits is also going to be in there. Um, and then financial management, organizational government, so your board bylaws, your org mission, um, the structure, your staff structure and hierarchy is also really useful. So here are some resources around, um, and this is timely given the question here, forms, policy procedures to be shared, we separated from the tribe and developing our own. So here are some resources uh, that I've found. Uh, BoardSource is always a great resource for any kind of things around policies and procedures or operating manuals or bylaws for um, board governance. Um, the Corporation for National and Community Service has a really great policies and procedures management controls workbook. Um, I put that PDF there. And then the National Council of Nonprofits is also really helpful as well. Um, but those are just some, some resources that I've found. Does anybody else have um, a good resource for sample forms or uh, around policies and procedures? Or does anybody feel like theirs are really good and they'd be willing to, to share? If so, go ahead and type that into the chat box. All right. So separate from policies and procedures, um, we have the employee handbook. So an employee handbook is more of a general reference for employees regarding the overall policies and procedures. So it's really written as a reference for employees. Um, and this is as opposed to your policies and procedures, which is really kind of, that, that's going to have everything. Those, that's going to be the long book um, that you re reference all of the different ways that your organization um, operates and all of the, the legal justifications behind that, whereas the employee manual is really written for the employees to quickly refer to um, those, those policies. So any policies around related to terms of employment, performance review, disciplinary processes, all of that um, should go in the employee handbook, but also anything around operating procedures, travel policies, um, operational matters, such as, you know, as I said, when your organization opens or, you know, what the office hours are, what the expected uh, leave time, vacation time is for things, all of that should also go in the employee handbook. So when you're developing an employee handbook, there's a couple things um, that are helpful to remember. You'll want, as I said, to make your handbook written as a reference tool for your employees. Um, make sure that anything that's in the handbook is consistent with what's in the policies and procedures. I've definitely had that frustration in the past where things have been in the employee handbook, but then the policies and procedures were different. Um, and that can be really confusing. So um, try to be as consistent as possible. Copy and paste what's relevant. You don't have to copy and paste the, the legal justifications behind anything, but you do want to make sure that those are consistent. Um, and it's also an employee handbook is helpful because it can provide an opportunity for employees to know what they should expect from their employer. They, they know what the expectations are. They know how their employer is going to treat them, and they know how um, they're expected to operate and work in your environment. Um, I'm curious if anybody on the call has any other thoughts or ideas about what's important to go into an employee handbook. Me, I would think maybe having an employee resignation or termination checklist is important. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. That should definitely be in your policies and procedures, but it, it could also be useful to have an employee handbook as well. I agree. Also, I think um, how to access how to, how to access, um, like, HR 
I don't have that in here, but um, I, I have had questions as an employee in the past about how to raise concerns that I've had either with a supervisor or with activities that I've had and not really been sure like what the process is for that or where to go. Um, so I think that could be really helpful as well. Um, yes, I agree. So the handbook combined with the policies and procedures can be a lot. So definitely separate the two. Um, otherwise, it's a lot of reading. Um, and then, yes, I agree. A lot of uh, places have uh, kind of a, as part of their onboarding process, an employee read the employee handbook and then sign it. Um, that's a really great <laughs> just like check method to say, you know, you signed this, you said you read this, and you understood the expectations. Um, and so that way you are, can be held accountable to them. So I agree with Sharon's note there. Having a signature page is, is really helpful for an employee handbook. All right, so here is a sample table of contents from uh, an, a sample employee handbook from the National Council of Nonprofits. Obviously, this is pretty lengthy, so, um, but it just gives some of the ideas of the different sections that could be helpful. So at-will employment, equal employment opportunity, policy about harassment, that can also be helpful, hours of work and attendance, as I said, kind of your operational policies, um, employment practices um, and just job description, salary administration, how um, compensation is um, distributed in the organization can be helpful. Um, some folks don't put that in there, but that can also be helpful. Benefits is a great and thing to have in your employee handbook and a good reference point for your staff. Um, leave benefits and other work policies. So this is just a sample, uh, an example of uh, what you might want to stick in there. So thinking back again about staff development, the, when you're developing this part of your whole human capital strategy, the most critical step is to utilize your job descriptions to develop that uh, performance review process. Remember to think about review frequency, as we discussed before, and include all aspects of performance management in your policies and procedures and your employee handbook. All right, so staff retention, always always a big question. So you may want to go ahead, as you're thinking about the employee life cycle, think about that staff retention, retention piece. So how can you limit turnover? Um, so lots of the stuff that we've talked about here will help to limit the turnover as, we, uh, as you think back to the earlier on in the presentation. Doing staff training and staff development can be a really, really helpful way of just building your employee buy-in and um, commitment and your, your skilled labor. Um, but there's some other things to think about. So um, consider like an annual or semi-annual employee survey. Um, think about how you can um, provide opportunities for employees, uh, for employees to share feedback regarding organizational policies and procedures. So again, as you're developing policies and procedures or as you're developing an employee handbook, um, it's a great idea to get input from your staff. Uh, again, obviously your board, but also your staff. They might have great ideas. Um, and that's a great way for them to be able to feel like they are invested in the organization, that you're listening to them, um, that they have a part of kind of building the whole staffing plan. Um, think about compensation strategies. Obviously, that's uh, a lot of folks' uh, first thought. Um, and then package training and development opportunities as part of an overall employee benefit. So these are just some strategies, but I'm curious um, if other folks have thoughts or questions around staff retention and limiting turnover. Hey, Megan, this is Jeff. I, I just, I, I think that, uh, I mean, everybody likes to get paid, so compensation strategy is important, but um, yeah. cross-training cross, cross and, and, and empowering them to, to be able to wear a couple of different hats at times, I feel that, uh, you know, people, I mean, they just feel more valued sometimes when, from my experience anyway, um, that, that seems to, to help um, keep, you know, have, have decent retention. So um, just a thought. Yeah, absolutely. I think the value piece is really critical here. Um, and I'm going to build off of what Beth put in here around staff reviews not being late. I once had a supervisor um, who was an hour and a half late for my review, 
and then uh, didn't have time to actually, and didn't send me the review in advance. It was very long, and I didn't have a chance to read it, um, and then only left 15 minutes for discussion. And I was, I did feel very undervalued in that moment. So um, I think there's two parts to that, making sure that if you do have um, policies and procedures like a performance management review process or expectations of your staff, kind of adhering to that as well, adhering to your own policies and making sure that things are on time, that they're happening in the way that you said that they would. Um, but then there's also this other value piece, which is outside of kind of being accountable to yourself and your own policies and procedures, as we've mentioned many times, kind of making time for your employees and making sure that there's opportunities for them to hear from you, that you're making space for them to um, talk about, uh, you know, things that they're excited about, things that they're concerned about or nervous about, um, really kind of that, that full staff development piece that we talked about earlier, kind of to making sure that you're creating the space for folks to um, communicate and feel heard and feel valued. Um, yeah, and then Sharon James has been talking about this EOS model that helps them see quarterly goals and updates um, and accomplishments. So yeah, that's another piece of performance management. Um, that's kind of a flip side of it is that, it's again, it's not really a performance management process is really not an opportunity to tell employees just what they've done wrong, but also to tell them what they're doing right um, and to help them feel, as Sharon put in here, empowered and like they are able to, you know, have the skills to do their job and that they have the opportunity and the space to do it well. Um, so yeah, I, there's a lot of different ways that you can um, retain staff through all of these different methods that we've talked about. I know staff turnover is always a huge concern. And as you said, Jeff, yes, everybody wants to get paid. So thinking about compensation strategies is, is um, key. Um, but also thinking about, you know, if you have limited budgets or you don't have much flexibility with your compensation, kind of trying to be creative about other ways that you can um, help your staff to feel empowered, equipped with all the tools they need, um, all of that good stuff. All right, so um, exit and separation. And so, yeah, as um, Sheila had mentioned earlier, it's really helpful to think about um, what needs to happen when it's time to an employee to leave their role, either by your choice or theirs. So what processes do you have in place that can legally protect you when you feel it's time to terminate an employee? Depending on the state that you're in, there are different laws regarding grounds for termination. So definitely get familiar with those laws and ensure you have the procedures written down in your policies and procedures to describe how you'll go about dismissing an employee. Um, that can be really helpful. I think we've all been in a situation where we've had a, a, a staff member who needed to go. It was time for them to leave their role um, for a variety of reasons. Either they weren't doing their job effectively or there were other behaviors, um, but there weren't the proper mechanisms in place to actually uh, exit that person um, in, in the right way. So they ended up having to stay for a long time. So that's another place where um, uh, performance management can be really helpful um, because if you're regularly tracking accomplishments or lack of accomplishments and regularly discussing them, with an employee over time, or you're regularly kind of documenting um, any kind of egregious behavior outside of just their job performance, um, that's really important as you're thinking about, um, you know, your whole staff management plan. Um, no one wants to keep somebody on board who uh, doesn't do their job well or who um, isn't an effective team member. Um, so outside of just the termination, what other processes do you have in place for when an employee leaves their job voluntar voluntarily? So as I mentioned earlier, will you conduct an exit interview? How will you re redistribute their job responsibilities or adjust the job description when filling the role in the future? Um, that's really helpful, I think, from an internal perspective to think about, um, to gather that information about why an employee leaves um, and use that information to think about how you can make changes in your organization? Is it that the work was just not the right fit or were there, was there something about the way that things were being run um, that could be changed to, to you know, um, to have less people want to leave, obviously. Um, Jeff or Sheila, any other thoughts around exit or separation? I, one thing that I um, had experienced is I, I don't, I can't stress how important it is to document everything. That's probably one of the hardest things to do is um, to terminate an employee. And if you don't have, you have to be specific and say on, you know, August 
um, you know, September 18th, you fail to do this, and you know, and you have to make sure you do something in verbal, and then and then follow up in writing. Uh, just make sure you document everything, dates and times, and start off with your your verbal, and then um, you know, document the rest because it's harder to let yeah. go of somebody. And the recourse that will come back on an employee, on the employer, is, is worse. Yeah. Then you're never going to get rid of them. Yeah, absolutely. The documenting thing. And that's, again, where, where um, having some sort of performance review process in place can be really helpful for that because we're all very busy. And um, it could be thought that, you know, a conversation, a stern conversation, you know, with an employee about something, um, you know, you may think, okay, well, that that's I did the thing that I needed to do, but if it's not documented um, in some kind of process, um, it's it's really it can be really challenging. Um, all right, so let's move forward. So that kind of wraps up everything about developing a human capital strategy. So we talked about um, what a human capital strategy is um, and how it can be really important to think about your staff, um, not just as employees with jobs to do, but as a, as a, as a resource for your organization. Um, and how thinking of it that way can really help your employees as well because they realize that they're valued and appreciated and they have the opportunity to grow in their skill sets, um, to, to build their communities by working at your native CDFI. Um, and so we talked a little bit about staff training, um, spe job-specific trainings, uh, organization-specific training, uh, kind of getting your staff equipped um, with all the tools and resources they need to do their jobs well. And then we also talked about staff development, including performance reviews, ways that you can um, let your staff know that you value and appreciate them, strategies for um, building their confidence, for helping them to um, you know, set goals for themselves and their jobs, but also their careers. Um, and then thinking about how you can do all of that at each stage of the employee life, life cycle, from um, recruitment all the way to exit or separation. Um, so I'm curious if there are other thoughts or strategies, uh, questions anyone else has, um, and what else do you need to um, implement or start or improve your existing human capital strategy? And at this point, Sheila or Jeff, feel free to share any stories that you have, and, and folks, please do type in the chat box. Megan, this is Jeff, and I just, I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, go ahead, Sheila. Yeah, no, go ahead. Okay, so, I mean, this has been super helpful for me because I, I feel like I'm in the same boat as most everyone out there in that we didn't, we don't have a formal human capital strategy, but but um, hearing what other people are, are challenged with, seeing what we have that's worked and what's not worked, um, and, and just having this this opportunity to to uh, work with everyone today, I mean, it has sort of helped me kind of envision what a human capital strategy would look like as a whole. And so, um, you know, I feel like this is something that we, we may consider formalizing um, after today. So thank you is really what I want to say. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Everything that, I mean, you know, like I was, like Jeff kind of said now, you know, we, we talk about, oh, you have to have your duties and responsibilities, give your job description, you have your performance evaluation forms, but I never really heard um, building, you know, human capital. And, and after today and kind of listening to everybody in, with this webinar, it really helped me to realize that we do have to have a capital, human capital strategy in place. It makes me feel like now, the you know, how important the development part of the training is and the learning process. I mean, those are two different, the training and the development are, you have to make sure that each company knows the difference and how are you going to be able to provide the training skills for your, for your staff and then, you know, work with them, I guess, talk to them, you know, on their objectives when you're doing their evaluations. I think one thing that's kind of worked, worked for us is when we're doing our evaluations on, you know, job performance, 
on the knowledge and skill factors, and then we do on the personal performance and the personal improvement, what we'll do is I'll give the evaluation form to, to the staff, and they'll grade themselves. And then at that point, they'll come, when they've graded themselves and they've thought about everything that, you know, their evaluation, then we'll go over it together. And it gives me the opportunity to see how they're grading themselves. And it kind of makes it a little bit easier for me because then if they grade themselves too low, that's, I can come and say, well, why did you grade yourself low here? You're, you're um, doing a great job and you're going over and above in this area. Or maybe sometimes they might even be getting a lot of high fives or a lot of fours, and maybe on the fourth annual review they go lower, and they kind of feel like they're, they didn't realize that maybe they can even get a lower score on that. Yeah, yeah I think that's a really great point, actually. Um, I've found for myself in the past as an employee, it, uh, in a lot of employee reviews, I've had to rate myself, um, and then my manager rated me, and then we met together, just like what you're describing. And I found that to be extremely helpful for myself as an employee to sort of think about, okay, here are the goals that I set, here are the expectations for my job from the past, you know, six months or a year. How have I done? And doing that internal reflection can also be a really great um, opportunity for an employee to kind of think what what have I been, what, where have I excelled and where have I not and why have I not excelled? Is it because, excuse me, I don't have the, the right tools or resources or knowledge? Um, and how can I talk to my supervisor about getting those things? Um, and I think that, or, you know, if I've done a great job, you know, this is also an opportunity for me to say, you know, what more could I be doing? And is there an opportunity for me to be doing even more for this organization and talk about that with my supervisor? You know, we both rated me great on this. So I think, you know, I've exceeded expectations. I've done an excellent job. I also would like to take on, you know, these additional responsibilities or um, I have a good idea of something else I can do. So I totally agree. I didn't touch on that. We didn't touch on that in this webinar at all. But giving employees an opportunity to assess themselves um, really helps with buy-in. And, um, you know, a lot of folks do internal self-assessments with their board, but doing that self-assessment with your staff can also be really, really great. Um, I think um, go ahead. And then not only that, Megan, but, you know, after you've had the opportunity and they've graded themselves and you sat down, then you go over together on the developmental goals and your objectives for the next period. And as a supervisor, you can go through those past performances and actually say what has been completed. You don't want to reprimand somebody. And, but at the same time, you want to help them. Maybe there's a reason why they didn't get that goal, and what could we have done as a supervisor to help them get there? Yep, exactly, exactly. I think that's I think that's a really great point. We have a we have one question here that was brought um, into the chat box about strategies for helping change the mindset of an employee working for the tribe, but is now working in a new nonprofit as the CDFI separated. Um, I think that's a really good question, and I wonder, um, Sheila or Jeff, if you have anything to say, to share about that specifically, but also in general, changing the mindset of an employee um, as, as your organization grows and changes and shifts or even adds new development services or new services in general or maybe are providing services to a new um, part of the community. So any ideas, um, Jeff or Sheila, that you might want to share around changing mindsets of employees? I think that's a really great question. Personally, I think experiences, I think just making sure that, um, well, first of all, your employee has to be mission-driven. Yeah. And they have to make sure that, you know, that you can re you can review your mission together and then make sure you how you're going to be in alignment in that mission. And with that, because they're in the community all the time and they're seeing they're having to take payments and they're dealing more with 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 the tribal members, and it's really political. And I guess how you can separate yourself is again, you know, taking them to maybe tribal council meetings, um, including him including them in the board meetings, then they can kind of see the political views 
and where table lending services stand as far as not trying to be in that political era. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that that totally makes sense. I think that's I think that's totally right. Um, Jeff, did you have other thoughts around that? No, I think uh, I think you know when she just talked about buying into the mission. That's that to me is uh, is key because um, it's you know what a great question. How do you change the mindset? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. I, I mean. Uh, that's that's one that I feel, you know, you you don't. It's just a tough one. It's a tough one. But I think it goes back to just what Sheila talked about. The first thing that she said was mission. And if they if they're not buying into the mission, um, then then maybe you're not going to change the mindset. Yeah. And, and maybe you have to yeah, move on. Yeah, I think this is the time. So. You're right. Because if they're not mission oriented, then they're they're not going to be the right for that job. Right. I agree. I also think that um, kind of building on that and the mission, I think that there can be opportunities, kind of what you were saying, Sheila, to bring staff into um, other aspects of the work of the organization that's not specifically related to their role, such as strategic planning, reviewing the strategic plan or involving them in the strategic planning process, so that they have a sense of um, what you're trying to do uh, as an organization, as a team. How are you trying to move the needle, and what the and what the strategies that you, the board and the executive director have chosen to get to that place? What is your mission, and how are you achieving it? And there are di lots of different ways of involving staff members in that planning process or reviewing it afterwards with them to get their input and feedback and to help them get that buy-in. But I think you're totally right. The core of it is they have to be bought into the mission. Um, and they have to think, they have to kind of understand why you're they're, you're doing what you're doing to get to that place. And, um, you know, again, there's, there's lots of different strategies of involving staff in different ways um, and getting their input to get that buy-in. But then ultimately, I agree with you, Jeff, if, if they're not bought into the mission, then they're not going to be bought into the work in the organization. And that's a really, that's a really difficult thing. Um, to do. So I think overall, you know, opportunities for um, sharing your mission, for um, clarifying um, your strategies and how you're looking to achieve that mission can go, can happen, you know, as part of staff development and, and um, in retreats, um, in one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, by receiving feedback from employees about the way the work is being done, um, and really kind of keeping that open and honest um, atmosphere and that culture of engaging your employees as opposed to just kind of telling them what to do. Um, these are all different ways that, um, that you can kind of build that. Um, so I think that's a really great question. But, you know, ultimately, if somebody's not bought into the mission, um, even if you try all of those different tactics and strategies, then um, it may just not be a good fit for them. Um, and that's also something that you may want to consider as you're thinking about writing your policies and procedures, um, as you consider writing your employee handbook, but also consider in your recruitment process is being really, really explicit about the mission of the work that you're doing and how the way that you choose to do the work gets to achieve that mission so that you, everybody knows and there's a very clear place you know, this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it. Um, and uh, having that kind of embedded in all of your different human capital strategy management techniques um, can be really helpful just continuously underscoring all of that. I'm sorry, Sheila, did you have something to add there? No, I just, you know, I think value your staff's opinions and ideas and, you know, encourage them to be innovative in if it's going to be in developing new products, or planning ahead for the future, ask them, what what can we do together? What do you think is going to work for us? And how should we handle this? Uh, just always include them. I mean, communication with your staff is really important. Mm -hmm. and, and communicate with them in, in any of those areas. What's important to them? Do you are you happy here? Your your staff can be doing great, but what are what else can you do for them? Are you providing them with 
you know, everybody has that Indian Health Services, but beyond that, do you offer them a 401k? Mm -hmm. How do you, yeah. do you care, if, you know, do they have dental benefits? Can you look for something, a plan to help them with vision? I mean, all those things are important. Sometimes we think just because we're a nonprofit that we shouldn't consider those, and we need to, because if we're going to invest in our staff and we want our staff to be invested in us, we have to show that we Absolutely. care about them. We value, Yeah. we want them to, you know, be proactive in developing all kinds of different new approaches. Absolutely. I totally agree. When I think back to the places that I've loved to work the most, it's been where I felt like my supervisors and the leadership of the organization kind of like had my back, for lack of a better word, where I felt like I didn't feel like I was kind of out there alone, like working in the field um, and feeling like I was alone there, but also feeling alone um, without the support. The places where I felt like I was comfortable going to leadership or going to supervisors and, you know, bringing up issues, and I didn't feel nervous about that. I felt like it would be a um, conversation as opposed to something that I was afraid of. So I, I totally agree with you. Valuing your staff and thinking about different ways that you can show them that you're on their side, um, that you're going to support them through, um, you know, all the different things that you do as an organization, including the benefits, um, but also in including opportunities for communication, opportunities for skill building, um, all of that stuff can be really helpful. Um, you know, we all have a mission. We all plan a mission and we plan a vision, but what about doing, you know, setting your core values together with your staff and working out that work culture and, you know, just, I, I think that's, that's important also. Totally, totally. And I love Natalie Charlie's um, a suggestion there that they show uh, a little video um, or it would be cool to show a little video of um, kind of how your organization works including success stories and I agree also Natalie that a lot of this that is an ongoing education effort um, to, to kind of keep that buy-in but uh, it really does need to start in the recruiting process um, and kind of underscoring um, what you do and how you're changing lives and how all the team members are a part of that um, and you know, doing that work together, and each person is a really critical piece of of getting to those success stories and and getting to achieving the mission. So, yeah, I think that's great. Um, I want to leave a couple of moments for any last thoughts or questions, and then there is going to be an exit survey at the end of this, so you guys can let us know how we did on this webinar. So please stay on and uh, fill that out. But um, I just want to any final thoughts or questions, um, type them in the chat box, or Sheila or Jeff, if you have any additions that you want to make sure we, we leave our wonderful attendees with. I think, uh, I think it, was, it was just a great uh, learning experience for me overall. I mean, I feel like just from all the comments that I'm seeing, it, uh, it uh, seems to be shared, so. Excellent. Good. Thank you. Well, thank you all for attending and for participating. Really, really appreciated everybody's um, uh, input, your thoughts, your questions. Thank you so much, Jeff and Sheila, your uh, comments and stories and uh, everything. You guys have been really, really great. Um, so just a reminder that uh, we are going to have office hours. If you have any questions for me beyond what we talked about here, or if you want you know, some further suggestions or further help or, or more resources, um, our office hours are scheduled for tomorrow uh, from 1 to 2 p.m. Devin Sheila will not be on that, but I'm sure that they'd be happy to answer any questions via email. Um, and I'm always available if anybody, if you're not able to make those office hours tomorrow, if you have any other questions, uh, go ahead and uh, shoot me an email. And um, my email address, I'll type it in here for you all. But otherwise, thank you, everybody, and thank you so much for attending, and I look forward to hearing about all of your fantastic human capital strategies in the next year or so.